Hello and welcome. You're here at the UC Alumni Career Network uh, session called Building a Sustainable Future, Careers in Environmental Justice. And on behalf of the University of California, thank you all for tuning in today for the February 2024 edition of the UC Alumni Career Network. My name is Cindy J. Lin, and I am a UCLA alumni. Um, a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists. Um, I'm an environmental and data scientist. Uh, I got all three degrees at UCLA, uh, working on environmental science and engineering. I had uh, worked for an extensive period at the US Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, um, and then also stepped off to work on co-founding a social impact data company called Hey Social Good. Um, I emphasized and co-founded uh, environmental justice via a San Diego Environmental Film Festival two years ago. We're really focused on telling stories about environment and people with a lens on EJ issues. Um, and also we'll be teaching a class on environmental law, science and policy. So I will be your moderator today, and that's a little bit about my background, but what I really want to focus on are our amazing panelists, and I'm really, really honored here to really share with you about old, amazing, and diverse careers in environmental justice. This program is part of a UC-wide effort to unite and support alumni all across our 10 campuses. We aim to help you with the information, the insights, and connections necessary to launch, grow, and expand your career, and give you an opportunity to speak to really innovative individuals who found their passion via the environmental justice lens. And I'm pleased to be joined by the four inspiring UC alumni here. Um, first from San Diego is Jamie Huynh, a UC San Diego alumna who serves as an environmental justice scientific advisor at the California EPA, uh, environmental justice, sorry, California EPA. And joining us from San Diego is uh, Mario Zuniga, a UC San Diego alumnus who serves as an environmental justice coordinator with the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, yay EPA. And from Los Angeles, uh, the metropolitan area is UC Riverside alumnus, Shah Selby, a conservation technologist and photographer. Um, and finally, from the LA area is Pooja Jabalia Pelham, a graduate of UC Riverside. Um, and Pooja serves as the global responsibility lead for food waste and hunger relief investment at Starbucks. Jamie, Mario, Shah, and Pooja, thank you so much, so much for being part of today's panel. And before we dig deep into conversation, I just want to take a moment and briefly define for us environmental justice. I know all of you guys work on it every single day. But just for our audience, careers in environmental justice combine education, policy, influence, inspiration, storytelling, networking, and advocacy to empower individuals and organizations who contribute to creating a more environmentally just world. This conversation is designed to raise awareness on the various career paths into the field and inspire you to consider careers that contribute to sustainable and just practices. So. Without further um, ado, let's dive into our first question and let those who are intentionally making a positive impact on our community share more about what they are, who they are, what they do. So let's start off learning a little bit about each of you. Um, can each of you share a little about your personal career journey? How did you become interested in the field of environmental justice and what type of work do you do? Um, maybe I'll start with you, Jamie. Sure. Good afternoon. It's so great to be here. Thank you to the organizers and Cindy for putting this on and including me. Really appreciate it. Um, hi again, Jamie Quinn. My my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm the environmental justice advice, scientific advisor here at the California Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I first learned what environmental justice was back in college. I was part of student government and worked on campaigns focused on plastic pollution and fossil fuel divestment. Very proud to see that the EUC's investment portfolio are fossil free now. Um, after graduating with my master's, I was accepted as one of the California Z Grant Fellows. The program matches recent graduates with municipal, state, and federal agencies in California for a 12-month science policy fellowship. I was paired with the State Lands Commission to work on their climate change and sea level rise program, offshore wind program, and updating their environmental justice policy. 
in that space, I met a lot of environmental justice professionals in the government sphere that landed my first big girl job um, at CalRecycle, where I was the environmental justice enforcement liaison. I worked with community members and our environmental enforcement staff to conduct targeted enforcement efforts um, throughout the state. Um, these efforts were community driven and the government staff provided the resources they needed to assure pollution burdens were lowered and that we built trust with communities again. Um, I was also very fortunate to have worked with a passionate team on a project called Pollution and Prejudice, highlighting the 1930s government redlining policies that explicitly used race to continue segregating communities throughout the country. We used current pollution and demographic data to show the disparities black and people of color um, continue to experience today from 1930s policies. Um, so yeah, and now I am the scientific environmental justice scientific advisor at California EPA. My portfolio covers environmental justice, working with tribes, border communities, distributing grants, uh, working on how to implement federal justice 40 programs and much more across Cal EPA six boards, departments and offices which includes pesticides, toxic waste, solid waste, air and water. So truly never bored in this job. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, there's so much there that I know people will be really interested in. Um, Shaw, can you share a little bit about your background? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I am happy to be here. Thank you, everyone. Um, the UC system is, is a fantastic, fantastic system. So I'm glad to um, contribute. Uh, so I, I went to UC Riverside. I studied chemical engineering, uh, which was a very small major at that school at that time. Uh, and my first job out of school was uh, <clears throat> actually working on satellites. Uh, I was a satellite propulsion engineer. I did that for a while. In that job, I realized that corporate engineering was not sort of my cup of tea. Um, and so <laughs> went back to graduate school. And during graduate school, that's where I started learning a little bit more about kind of the major environmental problems that the world is facing. And uh, more importantly, like the solutions that we have at trying to resolve those problems. And, you know, I came to it with an engineering mindset and I started looking at some of the tools that people were using in the field. So, you know, sensors and camera traps and all sorts of different equipment that was that was being uh, utilized to make decisions about the environment and conservation and environmental justice and all these sorts of things. Um, the when I first came into it, the tools that were available were typically very expensive, hard to use, inaccessible to folks in the global south or anywhere else in the world. Um, and it really leaned very heavily towards the West and people with big budgets. And so I decided that I wanted to try and solve that with, you know, my engineering um, uh, degree. So I started an organization called Conservify, which I'm in the lab right now. You can see it behind me. It's a, uh, it's a nonprofit technology development lab. Um, and we only work on environmental protection, conservation, wildlife conservation sort of uh, solutions here. Um, so we have all the same sort of stuff you'd find in a tech development lab in maybe Silicon Valley. So, you know, electronics, manufacturing, 3D printing, laser cutters, all that sort of stuff. But the lab is also full of the things that we use when we build these stuff and take it out on expedition so things like kayaks and ice axes and tree climbing equipment and the other sort of gear because kind of the the focus of what we would do is we would help to design a new tool to help to gain some insight into science and conservation and we would then take everything from that design all the mechanical software everything and we'd open source it for anyone to use um, and so we i've since started another organization called field kit that is doing that for environmental sensors so, because environmental sensors are tra traditionally very expensive um, but I'm, we're trying to prove that you can make them for a lower cost and make them accessible to a lot of folks. Um, so that's, that's sort of the work that we do. Uh, and, uh, and that work ended up um, uh, getting the attention of National Geographic. So I'm an explorer with the National Geographic Society. I was a fellow there for uh, a number of years and they funded a ton of the work, including, um, you know, the startup funds to start this lab. So um, yeah, that's, that's my background. It's awesome. And um, the data part really speaks to me. Uh, so I think making data accessible um, to our community is really, really important and key. Um, thank you so much. And then I'm going to ask um, Pooja, can you share about your background and also your journey with us? 
Thanks, Cindy. Hi, everyone. Uh, Pooja Jabalia Pella. My pronouns are she, her, and I work for Starbucks Corporate. Uh, my role entails uh, working with all of our food waste strategy and our hunger relief efforts. And uh, But I will say my journey took some time. Uh, I came to UCR where I knew that I wanted to find a role one day where I was going to make a positive impact in the world. And I decided to take a few environmental science courses and realize like, wow, this is really something to be a part of. This is something where I know I can create some change. And so decided to major in it. I have an environmental science degree from UC Riverside and then master's in policy from Pepperdine University. So as I started my career journey after college, I started working for various government organizations and I worked within the nonprofit sector where I was really able to gather a lot of insightful experience. Uh, in fact, I spent about 10 years in nonprofit and uh, searching for an opportunity to really bolster my passion uh, and experience through the sustainability lens. And that's really where I came across uh, working for a local food bank. I never thought that working at a local food bank would get me to where I am today, uh, but it did. Uh, it really is where I was able to spark this passion, knowing that food waste and food insecurity concurrently exists in a world where we have so much abundance of food. And so after learning kind of the alarming numbers of food waste and knowing that they coexist with food insecurity, uh, I started realizing that there were so many communities that were underserved and had low access to food and nutrition. And so knowing that these broken food existed, uh, broken food systems existed, uh, that is where um, I would say that became my North Star and where I really took this nonprofit background and lens and was able to then uh, take it from working at a local food bank to then uh, coming to a national level where I worked for Feeding America, which is a national hunger relief organization, has about 200 food banks under their umbrella really kind of supporting food waste and food uh, security initiatives across the country. And then I thought, why not take it another click higher and bring it into a corporate environment, which is where I, in fact, moved on to HelloFresh, uh, where I led all social impact and food waste efforts for the company across the globe. And then now, uh, very most recently, have come over to Starbucks, where I lead all of our strategy and food waste, food insecurity efforts as well. Very happy to be here. Well, then, Thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah. What that's an, like an amazing journey, and I'm sure lots of people will want to ask questions. Um, and then, lastly but not least, uh, a favorite, favorite agency in my heart. Um, Mario, can you share a little bit about what you do and your role at EPA? Of course. Thank you so much, Cindy. And again, uh, just, just echoing what everybody has shared. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share a little bit about the work we do and our experience and our journeys um, to where we are today. Uh, so I guess my environmental journey um, started in high school. I actually joined the what they called it Earth Service Corps, uh, where we kind of focused on on different environmental issues. Uh, we did some tree planting and, and and some community beautification and things like that to to address some of the issues that we saw in our communities. And um, since since the early age, I, I started learning about, um, you know, climate change and greenhouse gases and just thinking about the future that this is really a, a problem that affects all of us, all um, animals and plants. And I, I that's kind of what I wanted to work on. And I knew I was going to work on this for the rest of my life. I just found it really passionate, um, especially with with my love of nature and, and hiking and, and enjoying the the national parks and things like that. I knew that that's something that I wanted to do, not only to help humans, but also um, the um, the biosphere and, and, and everything, um, really. So that's where it started. Um, from there, I learned about the EPA in high school. And I remember just saying, OK, that's, that's definitely what I, where I want to work. It's it's my my dream job. And then so that got me to uh, learn about different opportunities that could help me uh, get into the government. I learned about Peace Corps. Um, and I learned that you had to have a, a bachelor's to be able to do Peace Corps. So then I was like, OK, I'm going to do, you know, <laughs> go to college because before then I wasn't really super interested in college. But, you know, I was a good student, um, had good grades. So um, I came on to UCSD, study environmental engineering there. And um, I remember taking some environmental systems classes where we learned about the different um, um, hazards and potential uh things that we all would have to face in the future regarding, uh, you know, climate change, its effects regarding about 
uh, regarding migrations, forced migrations, food shortages, and things like that. And I was like, okay, this is very serious. This is something that we all need to pay attention to and try to do our part to to um, address some of those things and prevent catastrophe. So it kind of just reinforced my idea that I wanted to work in this field. Um, so after UCSD, I, did the, I joined the Peace Corps. I was a education volunteer in West Africa. Uh, finished that service and I joined EPA shortly after. Um, so Peace Corps really, really did give me a huge leg up to be able to then join uh, the the federal government and the EPA. I started in um, EPA Region 4 office, which is based in Atlanta, doing air permitting. And uh, being a native of San Diego, having a huge family, really having family as a as a one of my priorities and my values, I knew I wanted to come back. And so I worked my ba- way back to San Diego. I was finally able to move here about two years ago. And, um, but throughout this whole journey, I was learning about the different um, different work that the EPA does and, and how EPA has been involved in the environmental justice space um, to really address the disproportionate effects being faced by some of the um, low-income minority communities throughout the United States. And Jamie alluded to Pride and Prejudice. Um, I want to kind of re-emphasize that and highlight that is really a great resource for those who have not visited uh, the website. Maybe we can uh, share the link later. Um, I'll try to find the link and, and share it with you all. But um, it, it's a really good resource to learn about some of the um, causes um or some of the things that led to such big um, inequalities and disparities between the cumulative impacts that some communities face. So just wanna encourage folks to learn more about that if you haven't done so already. Uh, but just throughout my career, I learned about these injustices and, and disproportionate impacts. And I just found a calling to that, um, that wanted to really make a difference. So that's kind of how I came into the environmental justice space. Um, so leave it there. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Mario. And just like a, a quick tidbit for those of you who are watching this, um, but uh, EPA just announced for the first time in decades, a new uh, air standard talking about uh, air pollution um, for PM 2.5. So those of you should look that up. It's really quite amazing and really exciting. Um, I hope that what you guys hear from all of our panelists is the diversity of I, their work in, in this area of environmental justice. You hear about people working on policy, visual storytelling um, in the corporate environment and this, uh, social impact, nonprofit, but also technology. So um, I'm going to ask each of you a question and have you guys share with us a little bit more deeper on to like kind of what you're wrestling with today and what are the solutions, how you're trying to overcome some of those. And I'll, I'll start kind of back around and I'll start with Jamie. You know, what are some of the current research projects you're involved in that's related to EJ issues? Uh, and how does that, like, how, how do you feel about how that's moving forward? Thanks, Cindy, it's a great question. Um, so I'm sadly not doing the kind of academic research that we're used to kind of connecting what scientific research means anymore. So I kind of wanted to separate that out to two different categories. Um, so there's the acad academic scientific research that we all know from our college days. And there is something else that Cal EPA is trying to um, promote right now is community science. Um, community sci Communities, residents, they live <laughs> they live in their neighborhoods, they walk, they drive, they know everything that's going going on. But me in Sacramento, I have no idea what's happening in Coachella right now. I don't know what's happening in Fresno. They do. And so how can we promote um, scientific theories and practices for them to conduct these types of scientific projects um, that don't need to go through the rigorous process of peer review and all of that, but still get um, the results that they need so that we can make policy decisions? So an example could be um, drinking water. Say in Stockton, in one of our previous um, initiatives that we've done there, they had a lot of poor drinking water and a lot of local government didn't believe them until we went, provided um, drinking, uh, sorry, drinking water testing kits to be like, okay, please like dunk this in. This is how you do it. Show us your results. And yes, there is going to be some error, but here are some additional test kits for you to try it out again. Um, 
And this way we can see like, okay, you noticed this, you've seen it, and now we have the numbers to support it. And this is what we're going to do about it now. This is how we're going to resolve this drinking water issue because everyone deserves a right to clean drinking water. Um, and another example, also in Stockton, sorry, I'm like thinking about Stockton a lot right now, um, <laughs> um, is uh, they also told us one of their priorities was addressing air quality in and out by an elementary school. They noticed there are a lot of trucks that drive by the school, but the local government was also like, oh, that road is not meant for trucks. Um, they're not supposed to be idling there. They're not supposed to be driving there. And so we sent out some of our inspectors from the Air Resources Board to just count how many trucks drove by. And they counted over 100 trucks in, within an hour driving past a local elementary school, emitting a lot of pollutants. Um, there's the reason why kids in that school had higher asthma rates and why their parents were worried. They were rightfully worried. Um, so this is the kind of community-led research that I'm working on now, not so much the academic scientific research that we're used to seeing. Um, and of course, still do some reviewing of scientific research um, from UC San Diego, actually, from the Tijuana River to make some policy decisions here. So there's a little bit of both for me right now. That's awesome, Jamie. And I think like you talk about water quality. I, I used to work a lot on developing water quality standards at EPA, but um, I think the community lit research is something that's super critical, right? Because oftentimes a community knows something's off, but they're not sure how to do that. So providing this avenue and access, right, to government and, and being heard um, is something extremely important and critical. Um, and, and I also just, you mentioned Stockton, but honestly, all of the United States, as all of you know, that there are hot spots of areas where EJ is more prominent um, and need better, I think, appro addressing than other areas. Thank you so much for that. Um, I know we can dig deeper, uh, but I wanted to like move on to vi um, visual storytelling. Um, and now you've heard a little bit about policy, but Shaw, can you tell us a little bit about your current research, which is a little bit different angle and lens, right? You're kind of trying to place into literally people's hands technology and approaches or monitors. Um, can you tell us like, what is the role of technology on wildlife conservation and, and environmental protection um, from your perspective and the work that you do? Yeah, of course. Um, so technology in general, I mean, it's instrumental for us to understand the impact that we're having on these ecosystems, to be able to document the changes that are actually happening. And a lot of times, um, you know, when we set up like a protected area or these policies come in, they're really just built on the data that we have. And that data that we have, it usually just comes from whatever tools that are currently being used. The problem is that the demand out there for more tools <clears throat> is huge. So like if we had a lot more information about the impact we were having on the environment or like, you know, how these ecosystems were changing, we would likely do a lot of different stuff. But the majority of our decisions are pretty like data deficient. Like we don't have enough information. We're doing the best with what we what we have. And so our focus is really like, how do we build, you know, new tools that that can help us to to, to solve this problem of having this big data gap? Um, and how do we make those tools easy to use so that you don't have to be a professor at a university to be able to figure out what's going on? And you don't have to have like, you know, coding experience or know how to deal with data. <laughs> like, let's just, you know, we, we've we all gotten so familiar with how easy these things are to use. And there, there's no reason why scientific tools shouldn't move in that same sort of direction. And so we've been thinking a lot about what that means. We have a lot of research on like, how do we build a new uh, turbidity sensor for the water or these sorts of air quality sensors? And so internally, our team is always kind of prototyping and developing and doing that sort of work. Um, but then when we when we do figure it out, then we say, OK, well, this design, we're going to put it online for other people to use. And usually communities and organizations bring us in to help them figure out how to deploy these things, and then what to do with the data afterwards. So, you know, we have projects 
in the Peruvian and Colombian Amazon around water quality and kind of how those communities can better monitor the water quality in their in their areas, and then how that data can go up to actually have some impact in the Peruvian or Colombian government, right? Um, we're working with the city of New York to do flood monitoring throughout all the mm -hmm. borough. So flood monitoring, it's an environmental justice issue. There's a lot of these communities now in New York that are facing this issue in a big way. And so all of the flood monitoring that New York is doing is built on field kit. Um, and so we're, we're like working with a lot of different organizations to try and do that. One of the projects we had more locally here, I'm, I'm based in downtown LA, um, was we were working with UCLA to um, study the heat island effect that's happening in places like Inglewood and Compton in comparison to places like Beverly Hills and Brentwood, right? And so like how this like heat island is is impacting people. And the, the way you study these things is you have sensors, right? And so um, some of the organizations we work with are using water quality sensors that we built that cost on the order of a couple hundred dollars. And the previous capabilities for a sensor like that may, may have been $15,000, $30,000 or more, right? And so we're really leveraging all the kind of tech advances we've had to really sort of change that. And once that data is there, you can really tell stories in a new sort of way about what's actually happening in your environment. And so like we think about, about that a lot, right? Once you get out of the hardware and the data is online for anyone to see, how do we make a place where people can talk about that data and share that data? And um, and that's really like the vision behind fieldkit.org. I think it's really the way that we have to go. And, and we're lucky we all live in the US where there is quite a lot of money available and resources to do these sorts of things. But the projects that I do in Cameroon or, you know, in the Amazon, all these other places, they don't have that. You know, you can't, you can't say you have to spend $10,000 on this sensor because $10,000 is what it costs everybody in that lab to work for an entire year, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it's just not viable. Um, and so, you know, I'm hoping by creating, a, you know, an organization that is doing this as a mission, as a nonprofit, and we're putting all this stuff out in the world that other people will see what we're doing, they'll take what we're doing and they'll build on it. And so that maybe, you know, five, 10 years from now, it's not the same sort of landscape of not being able to understand the impact humans are having on the earth as well as we can today. So. That is uh, so cool. And it's so on point, I think, right. Cause we're talking about, you know, Cal EPA, like with Jamie, your work in terms of trying to support community, but with, to your point with our kind of access to, you know, these smartphones and technology, it can be extremely easier. And as someone who used to work in a lab with fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000, it's so amazing to be able to hand, you know, an individual who feel empowered to have something that they can measure something that's meaningful and then you can upload instantly, right? And that's something that people are really familiar, I think that to get that into more hands of people and, and creating maybe even open source data and access is something that's super, super amazing and cool. I, I know, Shada, you have so much that you do. Like you could probably spend an hour talking about your background with, you know, you know, Nat Geo and stuff. Um, but I, I wanted people to know like with your kit, like how that is such an important component of this issue that we're trying to address with EJ. And I'm now gonna move to the private sector. Um, you know, Pooja, I think what's really cool with your background is you actually worked for so long, like 10 years in the nonprofit sector, right? Um, and going to a company like Starbucks, um, you know, moving away, even HelloFresh, HelloFresh, I think a lot of people know as that kind of like a meal kit that gets sent to you. Um, can you share a little bit about like the initiatives and products that you've been involved in, whether it was at HelloFresh or even at Starbucks and give us kind of a lens of like, how is EJ seen or trying to be implemented from the private sector perspective, right? Which is very different, I think, from like a government state level to, you know, kind of working on technology. Like, can you share with us like what some of the things you're working on? It's super cool. Yeah. So, you know, I think EJ really straddles on two pieces, right? We're looking at from the environmental perspective and certainly from like the social governance side. And so the work that I get to do at Starbucks, um, which I feel very privileged to do because we get to move the needle uh, with the footprint yeah. that we have, right? Um, our company has made some 
strong commitments for 2030. And uh, before we know it, we will be there. Um, amongst these targets, my team, so focusing on food waste and food security efforts, we have made two commitments, one of which is to reduce our waste by 50% by 2030, as well as reinvesting our funds uh, back into the communities. And we're hoping to reinvest 100 million by 2030 as well. Um, since 2016, Starbucks has had a program and has advocated for a program called a food share program. And it allows our stores and our distribution centers to donate unsold food into communities of need. Uh, really, we created this conduit between our Starbucks stores and several food banks across the nation. And essentially we are diverting surplus food that would otherwise go into the waste stream and being sent to individuals of need. And so many of these communities, as you can imagine, are communities that are underserved, many that fall within the lines of environmental justice. Um, and since then, uh, we've actually been able to donate 70 million pounds of food, right? We're talking about edible food that is safe for consumption, talking about our packaged sandwiches and our salads. Uh, we've diverted 132 million pounds of CO2 equivalent out of the waste stream as well, and have already invested 73 million back into these communities of need. So these communities um, have received funding through Feeding America, or through, um, through Feeding America in partnership with them, but through Starbucks uh, in the version of capacity building grants. So mm -hmm. what's really special here is we're not just donating our food to various organizations. Of course, certainly we are. But what we're trying to do is giving them the infrastructure to do so. So what that means is we're giving them capacity building grants, um, equitable food access grants. We're giving them grants uh, to... Um, be that much more uh, mindful of not just their infrastructure, but their distribution channels so that they can meet the need, right? At the end of the day, we really wanna be mindful of the fact that there are so many communities experiencing high rates of food insecurity, typically communities that are historically underserved or under-resourced. And we wanna mobilize our food back into these communities that have low or no mm -hmm. access to a grocery store. We're talking about more rural communities. And so by providing them the grants, we're helping them fund to get new trucks on the road, to get um, more staff to support these programs and ultimately more food to people who need it. That's so cool. I mean, I think some of those numbers are really, really impressive. And it's really happy to hear because Starbucks is so prevalent to hear a lot of these programs and the partnerships. And, and specifically, you mentioned capacity building, right? Community capacity building, which is, I think, a component that every all of us are trying to work on. Um, and I think that's really, really encouraging to hear how, empower, how empowering that can be. Um, and in terms of capacity building, um, you know, I want to now bring it to Mario, uh, just a real quick bit. You, Mario, when I was 10, I wanted to work at EPA too. So um, it's like kind of this thing of like, I think everybody here neuralizes all of us have this like ideal passion and we're still kind of trying to work on that. And, and yes, these are challenging, challenging problems, but I hope people are hearing like all the different ways they're addressing it. Um, but going back to the community, can you share a little bit of how, how does EPA engage with local communities to address environmental justice issues? And, and can you share some experiences that you have and, and what's happening on the ground? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. And uh, so I'll start off first with, uh, you know, the, the environmental justice program here in EPA Region 9, we're really focused on improving our environmental justice practices externally and internally. So. Uh, there's different ways we kind of look at, 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 you know, engaging communities better in a more effective and meaningful way. So we look at internal processes within EPA that we could um, potentially change or tweak to be able to engage communities uh, more effectively. There's a lot of statutes and laws that are very complex, very hard to understand. Um, and, you know, communities, um, sometimes have a really challenging time understanding and working with these policies, guidances, statutes. So one of the things that we we try to do is um, encourage that any outreach material is is easily understood and accessible to folks that it's if if we're trying to reach a um, community that's linguistically isolated, that the materials are translated, for example, um, some things like that that we're really trying to encourage um, for for us to more meaningfully engage engage communities. So one of the things that um, we also do externally is um, 
for example, we have a lot more funds now to actually go out to these communities and visit them, see firsthand mm -hmm. what are some of the issues that are happening. A lot of community-based organizations are willing to do, for example, toxic tours, show us the communities and things like that so we can learn directly from them. Uh, we'll bring technical staff so they can, again, see it firsthand and see kind of start some discussions. Uh, what are some resources that we could potentially tap into to address some of these things? Uh, right now, specifically, um, there are a lot of funding opportunities through the Inflation Reduction Act and Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill to address environmental justice um, issues in communities here. Um, and, um, you know, to throw a number out there, um, I know that there's a the Community Change Grant Program right now that was just um, kind of launched. Uh, they are receiving application, accepting applications through November of this year. And then it's a huge, huge, huge um, program. It, it's um, funded by $2 billion um, through the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's, it's a lot of money, a lot of funds. And so we're really, really, really excited. Um, for those interested in working environmental justice, this is a great time uh, to do so. There's just a lot of funding, a lot of support to address these kinds of things. Um, so yeah, we do many different things. Um, you know, I mentioned we go to communities. Another thing that we do um, is we, here in Region 9, we have monthly what we call community check-ins when we invite members of the communities to join these virtual meetings where we talk about separate, uh, distinct topics every single month. And we determine those based on community input and interest. So if they tell us, you know, we would like to learn more about, for example, brownfields. We had a session yesterday on brownfields. We'll bring in our technical um, folks that focus on brownfields. And so brownfields is this, this program where we um, do cleanup of sites and turn them into something that the whole community can use. For example, parks, um, transportation hubs, clinics, and things like that. Um, so we have kind of these sessions where we share about what we do as an agency, how communities can tap into some of these programs to propose projects, cleanup projects, for example, in the Bronzefield program. Um, and then we also use these community check-ins as an opportunity for us to learn about some of the issues that our communities in Region 9 are, are facing. And so we'll take that information, relay it back to our program staff, and see what we can do, um, you know, if and see if there's other partners at the local um, government level, the state level, or some community-based organizations that we can kind of link up together to address some of these issues. Amazing. So much, so many good things. And I hope people will look up. There's some of the links shared um, in the chat. You know, please definitely take advantage of it. So I definitely want to leave room for questions. I'm sure there's lots of questions for all of you. But um, can I just go around to each of you and if you can just give like one to two sentences um, and advice for our aspiring environmental justice professionals. Um, so just kind of one to two sentences and we'll just kind of go a little, not quite rapid round, but just so that we can get to our questions. Um, so Jamie, do you have a, a quick advice for our audience? Yeah, um, gosh, find what you're passionate about. The environmental field is so vast um, that there's a place for you everywhere. Um, continue to be empathetic and listen, especially if you decide to join government. Listening is a huge, <laughs> huge deal. Um, so I think that's that's my advice. I love that listening. Yes, Shaw. Yeah, I <clears throat> I did write a response in the Q and A uh, sort of around this, but I think the passion part's important because. Uh, you know, working on environmental issues is difficult and there's always, uh, you know, it doesn't move as fast as you want. There's always more frustration <laughs> than you expect to have around it. It's like, it's not a hard, it's not an easy thing to do, right? So you have to have that excitement about what you're working on. I mean, the good thing is that there's so many problems that you can definitely find something that you're excited <laughs> about that you can kind of focus on. And there's always more help needed. One thing I'll say is that, sorry, this is more than two sentences, but I volunteer for things all the time. And like I, some of my best opportunities have come out of volunteering. So don't think because it's volunteering, it's not legitimate that you could do amazing things with volunteering and it could grow to amazing stuff. So that is such good advice. I, I'm I'm there with you. 
for sure. Pooja. So I am a very strong uh, proponent of trial and error. Uh, you yeah. learn from every single one of your experiences, whether it's educational, whether it is in your professional life, um, and then leverage them into the next opportunity. Uh, like I shared, I, I never thought I'd go from working for a food bank to Starbucks, but I did, right? And um, I think we take those pieces and we learn and grow with that. Uh, we learn something new and we're able to take that to our next role. Um, some skills that I would recommend gaining though are you know really looking at those verbal and written communication skills i think that's actually much more important than many of us think is these days uh self-management being organized and finally just being open-minded right similar to what jamie said i think it's really important to live through an empathetic lens and being open-minded and listening to the world around you Pooja, starbucks is so lucky to have you honestly there's like just saying. That's very kind. Uh, Mario. <laughs> Mario. So I'll, I'll just add, add to uh, what folks have said and, and really encourage folks to, um, you know, as you jump into this environmental justice field to um, really be courageous, have a lot of courage um, to, you know, Say say what you really mean, um, and not be afraid to speak out when you feel like it. You need to because that happens a lot in, in the environmental justice space. Um, the just the topic itself can be really, really sensitive, really emotional. So having the courage to go yeah. into that space that is really uncomfortable to deal with some of these issues and and just face reality. It it, it, it takes a lot of courage, takes a lot of heart, but. I, I really want to encourage folks to not let that deter you from coming into this field and and really just, you know, give it your all and it have try to so that you can have hopefully no regrets, you know, say I was interested in this and I went for it and, and I faced that fear of or those, these doubts of, of, of kind of dreaming big and going for it. So strongly encourage you to all to just, you know, face those fears if you have any and um and and yeah, just just go for it. You won't regret yeah, it. Courage. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, courageous, and and I think to support our community, right, ourselves. Supporting our community means supporting ourselves. Um, I feel like I could talk to you guys for hours, and I, I have so many like probably a hundred questions in my head at each of you, but unfortunately we are out of time, and I want to make sure we get questions. So we'll begin addressing questions from all of you. Please remember to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and as we are waiting for those questions to come up, please ask our, you know, take advantage of really learning from our panelists today. It's quite amazing to get all of them in one room and to hear about their experiences. Um, so Yes, uh, we are open for questions. Please feel free to ask anything. And while I ask for questions, um, you guys have basically like um, a maybe a response on what might be unique about working on EJ here in California. And then I'll just, I'll do the same things. So we all know like who's next. Um, oh, actually a question just came through. So hold on to that thought. Um, will you share, so here's a question from, um, our audience. Will you please share suggestions for breaking into career EJ, um, and, or conservation after years of working in another career? And it, feel free anyone to take that. I, I, I could talk about that because, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, I, I spent 11 years, uh, in satellite. So that was like my career. And I jumped into this, which is crazy. Um, um, so I think one thing that I did when I was doing it was there was there was a, uh, a, um, a number of years where I was kind of exploring these sorts of things, volunteering with organizations, spending nights and weekends, you know, joining groups and clubs and other organizations that are doing this sort of work, learning the issues, right? I didn't jump right into a new career without really starting to understand what the what the kind of the issues were and where my personal place could be in in some of the solutions. And so I, I would say like 
if there's something that you're interested in, definitely start to do that. Start talking to people. You can just shoot random yes. emails to people and they <laughs> love hearing from other folks who are interested in the stuff that they're doing. And so it becomes a thing where like, you know, one thing leads to another and then like there might be a position in it for you. And and that when, when it's time to jump from that other position to the new one, it typically gets to a point where you're like, it feels right. You know, this is, this feels like it's a good thing for me to move into this new sort of thing. And like all the stars are aligning, but you really got to do that pre-work. You can't, it's hard to just like apply to jobs and get a new thing outside of it. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Doing, doing it cold is hard, right? To your point. Um, that's really cool. Uh, we have another question uh, for all of you. Is anyone working on indoor or urban environmental justice? There are so many indoor residential environmental problems, which have in part been caused by efforts to decrease energy use. I think this is because the tight envelopes of buildings actually cause more indoor environmental problems like mold, which are harming millions of tenants, poor communities, and even rich folks. Nothing has been taken into account that the climates in the U.S. which have not which have hot, humid conditions cause massive humidity problems indoors because of bad energy conservation buildings. I think the question is, are any of you working on indoor residential air pollution issues? Um, and I'm sure, for sure, Mario and Jamie are maybe take that one. Um, I don't personally work on it, but I have folks that do, and they they would know much more than I do. So I'm sorry, Laura, I can't answer much today. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just add, uh, well, similar to Jimmy, while I don't work uh, specifically on indoor air quality, I do know that the EPA does have an indoor air quality program uh, that does address kind of some of the issues that this question kind of is alluding to. Uh, you know, for example, in some um, um, tribal communities, there's the use of um, uh, wood stoves. So we've there's been a lot of efforts to change some of those wood stoves to um, kind of reduce the emissions that are, um, kind of trapped within the homes and things like that. So, um, yeah, there's a whole program out there to address these specific kinds of things. Um, I will try to share the link of the indoor air quality program uh, uh, so that folks may be able to access it and learn more about the efforts that um, are done here within the EPA to address those kinds of issues. So thank you. I just quickly put on my old EPA hat on air pollution. Um, indoor air pollution in the United States is responsible for 70% of emissions. So it is a, a really critical program, both actually at the federal level and at the state level. So even though Mario and Jimmy isn't necessary, but there's actually a lot more focus on that today too. But definitely please look at the link that Mario's gonna put in. Uh, awesome. We have another question. Um, in terms of a resume or cover letter, is there anything that specifically stands out in the hiring process that you guys have seen for applying a job on EJ? Do you guys see a specific format that will benefit the applicant um, during an interview or even a submission? Uh, happy to jump in on that question. So, um, I will say uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, one that I think really stands out to me is certainly kind of what you've already alluded to is the formatting piece. Uh, I will say most recruiters are looking for something that's really clean, really easy to read, um, that really highlights kind of the key pieces of your background. So I would always add like an objective or some type of summary or who you are. Uh, a lot of companies these days do not really look at cover letters. I mean, I hate to say it, but in my experience, I really haven't seen uh, very many um, people really looking at cover letters. They really look a lot more at resumes. Um, and one resource, which I never thought I would share, but it's kind of interesting, is Etsy. So if you're familiar with the online uh, company called Etsy, where you can purchase a bunch of homemade things, um, things that are... Um, just a variety of items. Uh, Etsy also has a variety of digital content creators that have um, created different types of resumes and cover letters. And typically you could buy a package for $20 or less. And I have actually purchased them myself as I was in the journey between going from nonprofit to corporate. Uh, I decided to purchase, you know, a new look to what my resume, like what my resume looked like. And uh, it actually paid quite off in, in dividends. So really, I think it's, it's an, it's an interesting way to look at it from like formatting, but I will say that, um, the way that it's formatted also can showcase your creativity uh, and the um, 
and just how it's displayed and, and easily re readable for the recruiter to view. That's a really uh, great feedback actually on that. And I think um, really helpful. Um, okay. So this question is about resources. Can you, one of you recommend, or many of you recommend, um, where to get better resources on planning and policy making of environmental justice? So I'll just share that um, EP, within the EPA, there's at the, at the national level, we have the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council um, that kind of tries to work on on policies um, and kind of the direction of where the EPA is heading to address environmental justice. So that is um, a great resource for folks. They um, These um, meetings are available to the public. They, uh, folks can join and learn about what is being discussed um, and not only by the EPA, but some of by also some of the environmental justice leaders with the, in the in the whole country. Um, other folks that join these um, National Environmental Justice Advisory Councils are um, community based organizations, local government, state governments. It's really a kind of like a collective of, of folks that def represent different um, kind of parts of the um, parts of the puzzle that kind of work together to address some of these environmental justice issues. Uh, so I can look for that in the, it, look for a link for the uh, NEJAC and, and share that with folks. But kind of going to the previous question, there's also a a, a right of federal resume YouTube video uh, that folks can um, tap into to learn more about kind of just tips and tricks on how to develop the, the resume. So thank you. That is so cool. I'm so glad you included that um, because it is a very different and just kind of piggybacking on what Pooja and Mara both said, but really know the organization you're applying to because every organization, so if you're applying, you know, for a kick-ass job at Starbucks versus a kick-ass job at EPA, they're going to look for different things with the different people. <laughs> they want different things. So just really doing the homework of understanding those organizations too. So I am bummed, but we're done with questions because I do want to leave room for something that I think will be helpful for the audience, which is I love to ask each one of you a one last piece of feedback with our audience. So if you can, in a minute or so, what's one thing you really want our audience to walk away with today? Um, I know you kind of gave a little bit about, you know, just kind of um, advice but I think in this context of all that's happening around us, especially for those of us in California and really dealing with storms, um, is there something that you want to share with the audience and what they want to walk away with so that we hope to get more and more people go into the environmental field? Uh, we'll start again the same um, uh, sequence. Jamie. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> You can pass if you feel like you need a minute or so. Oh, good. You're just going to get a little bit of word vomit from me right now. So <laughs> I hope that's okay. Um, yes. The environmental justice field is a very uh, broad field. It's it's hard to work, as one of my colleagues always calls it. Um, it's not just scientific work, communication, writing, whatever, all the different skills that contribute to this movement. Um which we need more, more people, not just science folks. We yes. need a lot of different minds, different skills to, to move this forward. Um, and one thing to always keep in mind is always self-care. Um, I think a lot of folks that I work with, uh, we give a lot, we are very empathetic. We um, put our souls and life into this work, but also don't forget to care for yourself because if you can't do that, um, you can't contribute, continue contributing to the work long term. It's a very much a marathon level type of work. It's not here. Here's a two week speed round and then you get a break in two weeks again. It doesn't work that way. So we're in here for the long run. Yeah, especially working with people, right, in communities mm -hmm. directly. Yeah. What about you, Shah? Yeah, I um, <clears throat> this is. You know, I think it's really interesting. There's that if, if you think about these environmental issues that we face, there are so many needs for different skill sets and personality types yes. to help us solve these sorts of problems. So, you know, I'm an engineer and traditional, like, you know, engineer. And um, 
started my career in that space. And when I first started like looking into these issues, I thought that there wasn't necessarily a role for that sort of engineer in those spaces. I, you know, I went to grad school and at a non UC, so I'm not going to say what it is, but <laughs> I would be in some meetings uh, and it, I'd be full of a room of, you know, environmental lawyers and, and conservation biologists. And I was the single engineer in that room and talking about things like drones back when people thought, when you said the word drones, people thought about what was happening in the Middle East. They weren't thinking about DJI and all this stuff that's happening now. Right. And so like there was, a, there was a lot of, of, of times where I thought I'm an engineer, I'm not welcome in this space, but I believe there was a role for me there. And I really think there's a role for anybody here who's listening in your specific skill set. If you're a copywriter, if you're an artist, if you're a musician, there's all these different things. And especially when you start thinking about environmental justice issues, which is, which is not only the environmental conservation side, but it's also communities and people yes. and, you know, and all of this stuff pulled together. And so there's, there is a need for your skills in the space. And really, you just got to find where that fits in. And sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it doesn't take that long at all. But really just putting yourself out there, understanding the issues, all that stuff gets you there. So, I, you know, don't feel discouraged if you don't have an environmental science degree that you can't work on this sort of stuff because you can. And I think uh, it's the norm that it takes a while because when I started, I was an English major at UCLA undergrad. And then, so I went from that thinking I was going to report on it to becoming a, like, a, you know, scientist. So uh, to your point, and I know lots of people who didn't even have any background in the environment, but had a, a passion to work uh, with people or environment and, and still went that way. Kuja, what about you? Yeah, so um, three words of advice or three um, types of advice, I would say, is um, one would be don't be afraid to fail. Uh, I think we are we have set ourselves up as a society to assume that we always have to be successful. And I don't think that's always the case, right? I mean, sure, success is wonderful, but there are so many learning pieces that come alongside that. So I would recommend failing fast and learning from those experiences and moving forward rather quickly. Uh, another thing is apply to different roles and different opportunities. Uh, I think most cases people look at jobs and they assume like I have to meet every single one of these requirements in mm -hmm. order to be considered an applicant. Um, and some cases, sure, I guess it depends on where you may be applying. You may need to have certain credentials as a requirement. Um, but I will say though, um, I have seen people in various roles and I think uh, College is a really important piece of that, certainly, but I think it's about what you've learned along the way that helps bolster where you can go. Uh, and then the final piece is um, there is a, uh, a saying, um, it's a Japanese saying called Aikigai or Ikigai. Um, and really what it is, is it's your life's purpose, right? What are you good at? What are you passionate about? Does the world need it? Can you get paid for it? Right. So there's a kind of all of these like various elements kind of put into this one thought process. And do you fit within that criteria? And where does um, where can you take that criteria moving forward? What is your life's purpose? And environmental justice, environmental sciences, um, there are so many opportunities out there. If you are someone who is a who really enjoys writing it's really a matter of really understanding the subject matter and being able to write confidently about it. If you are a scientist, it's like, what are you doing behind the scenes to like focus on water quality, conservation and air quality solutions? So I think it's really a matter of failing fast, failing hard, but moving forward, applying for different roles that may not necessarily like, um, you may not think you're a good fit, but go for it anyways, because why not? Right. Um, and then finally, identifying what your life's purpose is. You may not want to know what it is just right now, but you will. You will find it out in time. That's awesome. Thank you. Mario. I feel like you all laid very fertile ground for what I'm about to say, and that is apply to the EPA. Uh, yeah. So right now, it's uh, we actually have a huge campaign. It's called BEPA. It's a recruitment week. Um, and I'm going to put the link in the chat, uh, but we are actually recruiting. Listen to all of these folks say, said, and go to the USA Jobs today if you can. Watch that um, how to write the federal resume video. 
and submit uh, your applications and your resumes and everything. Uh, we are um, we have a huge hiring effort right now. I think uh, the number stood about 500 or so positions that need to be wow. filled at EPA. A lot of funding, again, to address environmental justice. So strongly encourage you to listen to what everybody here just said and apply today if you can. Um, and hope we can see you here at the EPA. Thank you so much. Yes. That's amazing. And it's a great uh, end to this. Yes, EPA has been, I had the most amazing experience working at EPA. It's the best place to work at. Um, and uh, take this opportunity if they're doing recruitment, that's rare for a federal government, uh, 500 positions. And one last thing about EPA, sorry guys, that I can't help myself, but apply again if you don't get it the first time because do it the second, third, fourth time, you'll eventually get in if you're committed. Okay, that's all the time we have. On behalf of the University of California, thank you for joining us today for our UC Alumni Career Network webinar. It was such a pleasure to have you connect with our amazing panelists. We appreciate your time time uh, making this event and I hope you gain lots of good information and advice um, and I love to thank every single one of you panelists for your time generosity and commitment to the UC system and providing your insights and advice and one last thing for me please connect with them um, all of these people are here today including myself because we want to be a resource and just making connections with our community thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day um, don't forget that this was also be recorded so you can actually uh, pass it on. Thank you so much. Goodbye.